Hello and welcome. Now, the world's richest man may lose this title very soon. Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos's divorce from his wife Mackenzie is expected to cost him this title and a lot, lot more. Now, take a look at this uh, next report. 25 years ago, an investment banker left his high-profile job to move to Seattle. This man, Jeff Bezos, married his love interest, Mackenzie and started an online bookstore from the garage of his home. Two and a half decades later, Bezos's professional venture Amazon has eclipsed Microsoft to become the world's most valued listed company. On the personal front though, all has not been well. The Bezoses have announced their separation. A joint statement released by them on Twitter read, and I quote, After a long period of loving exploration and trial separation, we have decided to divorce and continue our shared lives as friends. Having met at a job interview in 1992, they shared a common office space. After three months of dating, they married in 1993 and relocated to Seattle where the couple started Amazon. McKinsey is believed to have played a pivotal role in helping Bezos chat out a plan for the online retail firm. But as the firm grew, McKinsey took a back seat limiting her roles to hosting social gatherings, writing books and taking on philanthropic ventures alongside her husband. The duo fondly flaunted their romance in the statement. They claimed, and I quote, If we had known we would separate after 25 years, we would do it all again. But not everything is as bright and sunny as this power couple might want to project. Jeff Bezos is reported to have been romantically involved with the former TV personality Lauren Sanchez. A media scoop also claims that McKinsey is aware of his relationship and perhaps this could be the reason for their separation. Grape wine aside, there are talks of it being the most expensive split ever. If the couple split their fortune equally, it could make McKinsey world's richest woman with $69 billion in her kitty. Bezos' fortunes though will take a hit having to part with half of his wealth. Currently number one on the rich list with a net worth of around $137 billion, the split could push him to number two on the billionaire index. The talks of a bifurcation of wealth is based on Washington law which claims that all assets acquired during the marriage by either spouse are equally split unless there's a prenuptial agreement stating otherwise. There is also no clarity if the couple have a prenuptial agreement. But many believe that the settlement is going to be anything but ugly. Money can make divorces tricky, but for the ultra-rich, it can also make it far less frightening. Perhaps that's why the imminent divorce of the Bezoses sounds more like a transaction than an emotional upheaval. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Now, as the world gets talking about the most expensive split, let's find out who Mackenzie Bezos really is. She's a novelist and a mother of four authored the testing of Luther Albright in 2005 and Traps in 2013. Her father was a financial planner. She was raised in San Francisco and attended Princeton to study literature. Let's move on and find out who Lauren Sanchez really is. Now, Lauren started out as an entertainment reporter. She married Patrick in 2005 in a ceremony attended by Matt Damon and Jessica Alba. Three years ago, she became a helicopter pilot and set up a production company as well as an aerial firm. Now, the 49-year-old is twice married and is a mother of three. All right, shifting focus now to the UK where Theresa May is facing her biggest test yet. She has three days to get the approval from UK lawmakers for her Brexit deal, but the opposition is already running out of patience. Even before the session started this morning, the Labour Party had trained its guns on her. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn reiterated his demand for fresh elections if the Theresa May government fails to pass the Brexit deal. He said that a general election would take priority over a second referendum on Brexit. Now, he had made a similar statement in Parliament on Wednesday. If the government cannot pass its most important legislation, then there must be a general election at the earliest opportunity. A government that cannot get its business through the House of Commons is no government at all. It's lost its mandate, so must go to the country to seek another. And if a general election 
cannot be secured, and we'll try, then we'll keep all options on the table, including the option of campaigning for a public vote. But an election must be and is the priority. It's not only the most practical option, it's also the most democratic option. Also on Wednesday, Theresa May had warned lawmakers that it will either be her deal or no deal. But today, the British government said that it will accept a demand by the Parliament to set out its Plan B if Theresa May's deal is rejected next week. The gentleman's other points on will the, um, will the Prime Minister, will the government accept the Grieve Amendment? Of course the government will do so. The Prime Minister has shown her willingness to always return to this House at the first possible opportunity if there is anything to report in terms of our Brexit deal and we will continue to do so. The Parliament witnessed a heated exchange between her and Corbyn. Theresa May's precarious position in a minority government is now out in the open with 20 lawmakers from her own party voting against the government on an amendment to the finance bill. All right, shifting focus to the high drama in the U.S. President Donald Trump storms out of talks with opposition lawmakers over the impasse over funding for the border wall with Mexico. Trump called the White House meeting to end a three-week-long government shutdown as a total waste of time. He tweeted, and I quote, Just left a meeting with Chuck and Nancy, a total waste of time. I asked what is going to happen in 30 days if I quickly open things up. Are you going to approve border security, which includes a wall or steel barrier? Nancy said no. I said bye-bye. Nothing else works, unquote. America is heading to the 20th day of the well, partial government shutdown the caused by disagreement over the wall. Uh, with the yes. meeting between Trump, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer and House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other leaders ending in acrimony, it now seems that an early resolution is not in sight. Exasperated Democrats called Trump's behavior a temper tantrum and said that the meeting broke down when they refused to commit the funding is proposed border wall. Fortunately, the president just got up and walked out. Uh, he asked uh, Speaker Pelosi, will you agree to my wall? She said no. And he just got up and said, then we have nothing to discuss, and he just walked out. Thinks maybe they could just ask their father for more money, but they can't. But they can't, and we think that the collateral damage that he is causing uh, by... Uh, well, I'm going to yield to the leader to talk about that, but I would say this. Uh, if you don't understand financial insecurity, uh, then you would have a policy that takes pride in saying, I'm going to keep government shut down for months or years, unless you totally agree to my position. With the ongoing impasse, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her fellow Democrats, who took control of the chamber last week, plan to advance a bill to immediately reopen the Federal Finance Ministry, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and other agencies that have been partially shut down since the 22nd of December. Trump says he will not shy away from declaring a national emergency to press his case. We talked about, a couple talked about, you know, a couple uh, talked about strategy, but they're with us all the way. They're with us. Mr. President, what about the idea of... I, I mean, I just want, because you know, the fake gives the fake news, and I just want to tell you that the Republicans are totally unified. Now, if you would ask the same question to the Democrats, you let me know in some of those districts where I won or that are a little bit more towards sanity. Uh, you want them to run, say, we don't want to have border security? You've got plenty of Democrats that do not want to be in this battle. You have a lot of Democrats. The Republicans are unified. We want border security. We want safety for our country. Now, close to 12 hours later, Donald Trump took to Twitter and took a dig at the Democratic leaders. He said, and I quote again, Brian Chuck told his favorite lie when he used his standard soundbite that I slammed the table and walked out of the room. He had a temper tantrum because I knew he would say that. And after Nancy said no to proper border security, I politely said bye-bye and left. No slamming.
unquote. Meanwhile, Democratic Party's lawmakers from California delivered a large can of trash to the White House. It was done in an attempt to raise awareness about the trash that continued to pile up in national parks due to the shutdown. They carried trash cans with the phrase Trump trash written on them. They said they did the work of clearing trash from the parks that was supposed to be done by U.S. government employees. What we need is for President Trump to wake up and smell the coffee cups and the diapers and the burrito wrappers and the trash that is piling up. And soon we'll have enough of it to build a wall, perhaps. But uh, it's a real problem. Now, it's not just the 800,000 federal employees that have been hit by the U.S. government shutdown. The shutdown is affecting other Americans, too. And it can hit millions if it does not end soon. Now, 36-year-old Bill and Teresa Striffler are a couple living in New Jersey. Teresa is nine months pregnant and is expecting the baby anytime. Her husband, Bill, is an air traffic controller at Newark Liberty International Airport. He is being forced to work without pay. He is finding it hard to provide for his pregnant wife. Now, his wife is a sales worker and she is on maternity leave. The process required for her to apply for insurance is taking longer than expected. I'm nine months pregnant, so literally do any day now, and I just went on maternity leave, so I'm trying to get disability, and we don't know when that's going to come through. So between the two of us, neither of us are getting paid right now. If the shutdown continues, they'll be facing a lot of financial problems around the baby's delivery. Now, even though the baby is their priority right now, they can't take their minds off the uncertainty over the future. Not a situation that I hope that anybody, you know, has to ever go through. You, you, you know, this is, I'm working every day, so I would expect that I'm going to get paid, not have to worry about how I'm going to pay my mortgage this month and, you know, how I'm going to, you know, afford to, you know, take care of the baby and my wife. Now, Tamil movie superstar Rajnikanth is back to enthrall his fans in the Pongal festival season. Rajnikanth's first film of the year, Peta, has been released. Now, after enthralling his fans by playing a scientist, Vasigaran, and Chitti the Robot in last year's movie 2.0, Rajnikanth is back on the big screen. In his latest flick, Peta, Rajni plays a hostile warden. The Tamil word Peta literally means hood or the area under one's control. The film is directed by Karthik Subaraj, who is an ardent Rajni fan himself. The star-studded cast includes Trisha, Simran and Nawazuddin Siddiqui, among others. The film is releasing at a time when a few theatres are still running Rajini's previous film 2.0. And Rajini Khan's fans are all gung-ho about this release. The fans have been celebrating and bursting crackers in front of theatres. They are also offering prayers in temples for the success of the movie. A Chennai couple probably found it the most auspicious moment to tie the knot. In fact, they got married outside the Woodlands Theatre in Chennai. All right, moving on, world leaders are in India's national capital for a global summit. Nepal's foreign minister too is in India and Vyond's Siddhan Sibyl caught up with him. Pradeep Gewali spoke to Vyon on a variety of issues. Now, Gewali spoke about Nepal asking India to make 200, 500 and 2,000 notes legal tender in Nepal. On Monday, Nepal's Central Monetary Authority had written a letter to the Reserve Bank of India asking it to make Indian bank bills rupees 200, 500 and 2,000 legal tender in his country. He also spoke about ties between the two nations which have been strained for a while now. With me is uh, the Foreign Minister of Nepal, sir. Welcome to Beyond. My first question is, how do you uh, rate or see India-Nepal ties in 2019? In 2018, we saw the Indian Prime Minister visiting your country twice. Yeah, uh, it is a symbol of uh, the importance uh, both leaders uh, give uh, to, the, to our bilateral relations. Indian Prime Minister visited twice, uh, our Prime Minister came here, and the uh, frequent exchanges of visits are uh, uh, there. 
such type of uh, exchange of visits has contributed to further strengthen and uh, widen our relation and we are satisfied the excellent uh, level of our relation so one of the crucial issues uh, today india nepal uh, uh, relationship uh, if looking at the entire dynamics is the issue of currency uh, demonetization uh, you recently banned the higher denomination notes what do you have to say on that are you in discussion with the indian government on that uh, actually uh, there is, there was no any ban but uh, we uh, seek a type of assurance from uh, the indian government and indian uh, central bank that the new uh, notes uh, of uh, worth uh, 200 500 and uh, 2000 uh, are equally um, uh, valid uh, to uh, bring to exchange to uh, use uh, so that type of assurance we are seeking from the indian side and i do believe that uh, to uh, central banks of both countries uh, will settle uh, soon. A 32-year-old Syrian woman is challenging gender stereotypes on the football pitch. Mahajanu decided to turn around an injury that threatened to end her career into an opportunity that's setting an example for millions of women in her war-torn country and around the world. Today, Maha is an assistant coach for an all-male football team in Syria the first woman in West Asia to coach a professional men's side. If you thought coaching an all-male football team is a job for the gentlemen, Syria's Maha Janud has proven that leadership is a skill regardless of gender. The 32-year-old Syrian is the first female in the Middle East to coach the Al Muhafaza, a men's soccer club based in Damascus. This in a country that is still dealing with a civil war. Maha played for the Syrian women's national team and the Al Muhafza women's team. After an injury threw her to the sidelines of the game, she didn't lose courage. Then Al Muhafza decided to break the mold by hiring her as a coach. But it wasn't easy for Maha to get the team to warm up to her. Yet she persevered. Now, with her as coach, the club has won eight of the ten games they played this season. التدريب هو علم قبل ما يكون اللي عم يأدي العلم هذا أنسى أو ذكر هو علم لما بكون هذا الشخص اللي عم يعطي هاي الرسالة هي رسالة التدريب للفريق واسق بمعلومات وعم بيأدي معلومة صحيحة عم بيكون له كاريزما خاصة قيادية بأرض الملعب هاي ما ما بتفرق بين شاب وبنت Due to the Syrian conflict, the country's women team didn't get a chance to play for several years in this decade. Today, Maha is an icon for young girls in a country where women play second fiddle to men. مفصولين يعني في عنا مشالح للذكور مشالح للإناس لاعب بفوت مثلا وقت اللي بده يبدل ثيابه إن كان مدرب رجل أو أنسة أكيد ما راح يبدل كل شيء قدامه فلا هو ما فيها الضوابط ومثل ما قلت لك يعني الاحتكاك الأخلاقي موجود سابق. The Syrian crisis has displayed nearly seven million people within the country while five million have fled entirely. Maha is a ray of hope for women rebuilding their lives in the war-torn country. Bureau report, we on World is One.